Hi, my name is Gretchen Vandeley. I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego, and my presentation is on using trajectory methods to identify sensitive periods during pregnancy. So you just heard from Christy Palmston about different types of trajectory methods. And now in my presentation, we're gonna go through some specific examples using both k-means longitudinal as well as group-based trajectory methods with an application towards perinatal epidemiology. We were interested in exposures to alcohol we also were interested in doing this same approach with antidepressants in pregnancy. And the motivation there was that we tend to think of antidepressants as a binary exposure, either you're taking them or you're not during gestation. But we know that that's not true. We, we know anecdotally that women will come off of their antidepressants because they're worried about the effects in pregnancy. Women may actually start taking antidepressants later in gestation, or there may be dose changes. And so we were interested in seeing whether we could apply that same methodology to antidepressants across gestation. So here we used data um, from an administrative claims data set, Optum Labs Data Warehouse. And after we sampled the women with live born infants and applied continuous enrollment around those, we ended up with a sample of 227,000 deliveries, which we were really excited to get to do trajectories in there because this was a much, much larger data set than we um, had previously gotten to use. So when we did the trajectories on antidepressant use, what we see, so we've modeled these twice. We were interested in malformations. As I previously said, those really have a critical period of the first 12 weeks. So we did, we looked at antidepressant exposure here in the top panel, just through 12 weeks of gestation. And then at the bottom, we ran it out through 35 weeks. What Dr. Palmson was saying about, you'll have missing data, essentially, if a woman delivers at earlier than another woman, what we did is we, we had all pregnancies ending at 35 weeks. If the woman, if we, she was known to deliver before that, she was actually removed from this data set. So everybody had observable information through the 35 weeks of gestation, um, which is kind of one way to get around the variable length and the end of pregnancies. So here, um, what you can see is that there, there were the five trajectories here with um, women who started on, these are average fluoxetine equivalents who started at a low dose and discontinued or reduced um, even further their exposure. We had a, a low sustaining group. We again see this group that came in around 40 um, fluoxetine equivalents, one that discontinued and one that sustained, and then this higher sustaining group. And what's interesting, when you look at these 12 weeks and then look at it out of the 35 weeks, there's not a lot of movement after the first 12 weeks. So essentially after the first trimester, the antidepressant use didn't change much, but there was a lot of change um, kind of in that initial first trimester of pregnancy. And one thing to note on something like this, you know, with things like alcohol or other exposures that are all the same, you can just go ahead and model that. With something like this that are antidepressants across multiple different types of antidepressants in classes, you have to have a standard that you can map those all to. So here we converted these all to average daily fluoxetine equivalents. There are other, if there's no standard or you're doing kind of medications across things that can't be standardized, there are other ways people have done this with things like defined daily dose or things like that, but you do need to get all of your exposure into kind of one standard to be able to model it all together. And what I really wanted to highlight with this is that when we looked at our different outcomes, you see differences in kind of the pattern of the outcomes based upon the, um, the ex exposure trajectory. So here for cardiac malformations, again, this was only modeled through 12 weeks, but what we see is that the real kind of excess risk of, of cardiac malformations was happening in those two highest sustained trajectories. However, when we were interested in preterm birth, we see a pattern fairly similar to this, that if, if antidepressants in gestation were either very low or discontinued fairly early in pregnancy, they didn't confer an excess risk of preterm birth, whereas the sustained trajectories did have a slightly um, increased, modest, but increased risk. When we looked at neonatal respiratory distress, this is where it was really interesting. So here we found that even antidepressants that were discontinued early in pregnancy or that were maintained at very low doses still conferred a slight increased risk of neonatal respiratory distress. So it just kind of goes to show that based upon your outcome, the nuance um, in these trajectories may kind of confer different risk estimates that we probably wouldn't see if we were using, well, we certainly wouldn't see if we were using something like a binary exposure. And this can actually potentially shed insight into different um, sensitive periods 
based upon being able to um, to compare the different trajectories against each other at different time points in gestation. So the last example I want to show is one with oral corticosteroids. And this is Dr. Palmston's work. And what was really interesting about this is that the two exposures I've shown you before were kind of more of a chronic type exposure. Whereas Dr. Palmston wanted to apply these methods to oral corticosteroids, these are taken on a PRN basis or as needed. And so the question was, could you still fit these trajectories with something that has a much more um, kind of sporadic profile of use than something that you know, tends to have kind of more smooth dis um, distribution. So in Dr. Palmston's study, what you can see here from something like oral corticosteroids is that they really are taken um, it differently by different women. All of, in this um, example here, all of these lines are a woman. The black dots are where there was um, no oral, oral corticosteroid use. And so here you can see like someone used it, they stopped using it, they used it, they stopped using it whereas others kind of used all the way across gestation. And so the question was whether these would work well in um, the, the trajectory methods. So here they've done the daily dose. And if you could see the tracings behind this, you would see that you have a lot of kind of up down here of people taking corticosteroids and not taking them and taking them and not taking them. And you see that in the confidence intervals around these trajectories. They then modeled this as a cumulative dose. So they kind of smoothed out that distribution by saying, by letting the exposure accumulate over gestation, if you stop taking it, you stay at that level. And then if you resume taking it, you go up, but it creates that more kind of smooth um, trajectory that you see here with a lot tighter confidence intervals around each trajectory group. And they were then able to actually look at both trajectories um, with their outcomes of interest, you know, to determine kind of which ones better predicted um, the outcomes of interest in this study. So this is really just to kind of show that it is possible to model these with different types of exposure, with exposures that may be more intermittent or infrequent. You may just need to think about kind of the underlying functional form of how you're mapping your data before you run the trajectories. So to summarize, these trajectories can be applied to either the exposure or the outcome. I've shown you here examples with the exposure, but these can just as easily be applied to outcomes as well. They are applicable to acute or chronic events. You may just need to kind of think about that underlying kind of functional form of your, your variable prior to um, running the trajectory analysis. There are limitations. Uh, Dr. Palmson mentioned things like the inability to adjust for time varying confounding. So if that's a concern, in your, um, in your field of interest, then this may not be the method for you. And you may wanna look at, um, at other types of, of methods that uh, allow you for modeling time varying confounding. There are sample size considerations, as we've mentioned, you have to kind of think through what's the smallest size you can have in each trajectory to be able to then do anything with it. Because at the end of the day, after you get people into their trajectories, it just becomes a variable of you know, zero, one, two, three, or whatever your trajectory assignments were, like any other kind of variable you would put into a model. So you have to think about the, the um, strata size for that and, and what will be um, kind of analytically relevant in your analysis. However, we, we have found that these nicely incorporate time, dose intensity, and duration of exposure, and we found them to be quite useful in, um, in studies where, where it's important to be able to incorporate in all of those.